Hey friends, it's been a while since I addressed you all, and way back when I said I wanted to make a video about sex and gender and the wild misinformation that was being spread around the atheist community at that time. I held back, though, for a couple of reasons, and I think they're good reasons. First of all, I'm a cishet dude, and I don't want to be the cisplaining guy who is speaking outside his experience. So I held off for that reason. And secondly, there have been a number of trans folk who have been making excellent videos on the subject. Essence of Thought, for instance. And you should listen to trans voices before you listen to me. But a few things have kicked me off the fence. First, today is Transgender Day of Visibility, and I'd like to make some small contribution to it. Second, the governor of Idaho just signed an anti-trans bill into law, and the language of the bill just grates on me. It is scientifically invalid. And thirdly, I figure I could just confine myself to talking about my own domain of expertise, which is developmental biology, and bring to your attention a specific paper that addressed these concerns 52 years ago and represents much, but not all, of the contem contemporary consensus of biologists. So first I'm going to say a bit about the work of Keith L. Moore. He's probably most infamous in the atheist community for his comments praising the accuracy of the Koran. Uh, in particular, the Koran's description of early human developmental biology. I have criticized those comments myself. I'll include a link below to my own rejection of the comparison uh, because the Koran is vague and general and clearly cribbed straight from the writings of Aristotle and Galen. So it's not a testimony to the infallibility of Mohammed, no matter how much Islamic apologists want to make it so. However, within the biology community, he's best known and highly respected as an educator in the field of clinical anatomy. I've used his textbooks. Many nurses and doctors will recognize them. They're still used today. For instance, he's the author of Clinically Oriented Anatomy, which is right in his ballpark. He was a clinical anatomist. He's written texts on clinical embryology, which was where I got to know his work. OBGYNs and nurses ought to be particularly familiar with his contributions there. He might be best known among the general public for the developing human. It's intended for medical professionals, but it's clearly written on a fairly simple level, and it's a good source for the general public if you want a detailed discussion of the stages of embryonic development and pregnancy. A word of caution, though, don't rush out and buy it if you or your spouse is pregnant. It may not be the best book to read because it also contains thorough descriptions of congenital defects. Yeah, when we were having children, my wife did not want this book even in the, in the house because it's kind of scary. Okay, but today I'm going to focus on one paper he wrote, a short review of the sexual identity of athletes published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Note the date, 1968, 52 years ago. I was in fifth grade then, so no, I did not read it hot, hot off the presses. Uh, to put it in context, though, at the time and in the 1970s, there was a growing wave of concern that the J Russians and East Germans in particular were cheating injecting women athletes with anabolic steroids to turn them into men to compete with women. Or taking women and jacking them up on all kinds of drugs in order to compete unfairly. Even in the fifth grade, I could get the gist of the jokes. If you're strong, you are not really a woman. Uh, these are contemporary comics, though. It's simply been absorbed into the public consciousness that there is an ongoing con conspiracy to subvert athletics with performance-enhancing drugs, and in particular to smuggle male attributes into competition with women. 
which they're certain would not be fair. Moore was familiar with the idea and rejected much of it. This paper begins, the question of whether certain female athletes are in fact female will certainly arise during the medical examinations at the Olympics. And he was concerned that there was confusion in the minds of some, however, concerning the contribution of various factors, genetic, gonadal, or hormonal, towards the sexual identity of an individual. He was right. There is still a lot of confusion. He wrote this paper to point out the inadequacy of our definitions of male and female, to explain that sex is a property with multiple parameters, and that the crude testing being done was going to result in injustice and bias. And it's still true. So let's jump into this paper. This is a key graph from the paper. I first want to make a caveat. This is an old paper from the 1960s. And I don't agree with it in its entirety. Moore is still expressing this view that any deviation from a stereotypical pattern is abnormal. He even uses that word. I wouldn't phrase it this way now, nor would I think most biologists. Variation is normal. Individuals who don't fit our preconceptions of what male and female are should not be stigmatized, and it is the cause of much misery to demand that a normal individual must fit a very narrow template. But this is his important point. Sex is not a unitary thing. It can be summarized as a binary. Moore identified nine components of an individual sex that can be assessed independently. Their external genitals, their internal reproductive organs, the cellular structure of the gonads, their hormones, the presence of genetic markers, nuclear sex, such as the presence of bar bodies, whether they have or don't have Y chromosomes, and significantly, their psychological view of their own sex and the social perception of their sex. He supposes these separate criteria are usually in agreement with one another, that is, the cis-heterosexual condition, but that they can also vary from one another. Even if you insist that each of these nine parameters has only two possible states, male or female, they don't, many of them vary by degree, that would imply the existence of two to the ninth sex combinations, or at least 512 sexes. You'd also have to argue that the list of nine is complete, which I do not. I think there are more molecular genetic pathways to produce the various physiological sexual states and that they all have different subtle and not so subtle variations. So can we all just agree that there are as many sexual variations as there are people on the planet and stop insisting that they all must conform to only two possibilities? Moore's main point though is that all these various tests used in a futile attempt to shoehorn all athletes into just two sex categories don't work and cannot be used as indicators of true sex, whatever that might be. There will always be exceptions. I'd argue that true sex is an illusion pursued by people who want to insist that it is what it isn't and who will be forever frustrated by their failure. His conclusion is that you can't use any of these tests to make absolute determinations of the sexual identity of individuals. Sex is not the precise two-sizes-fit-all binary that some people want it to be. As anyone who has had sex should know, humans are not pressed into existence with a pair of cookie cutters. Yet here we are in 2020, and Idaho's House Bill 500 is insisting that we have to assign a sex to individuals based on criteria that biologists were saying were bogus half a century ago. The criteria aren't even internally consistent, since assessing A, B, and C can give different answers. All on its own, A can produce different answers based on internal versus external anatomy. They also don't seem to appreciate that in defense of womenhood, they are imposing a set of intrusive invasions of privacy for women and women only. 
So to summarize, way back in 1968, biologists were fully aware of the complexity of the problem of sex and rejected attempts to force fit it into a binary condition. I wouldn't call this the final answer, but it says that sex is at least a nine-dimensional problem involving all of these parameters and more. Justice demands that we avoid oversimplifying and pretending that it's reducible to two. Does this imply that the issue of identifying the sex of athletes is intractable? No. More even suggests that those who exhibit advanced virilism, such as male external genitals and physique, or unusual growth of hair on the face, or, or who have levels of plasma testosterone identical to that of males, should be ineligible. So you're saying we should take a holistic approach rather than just simply rejecting uh, or relying on one criterion that isn't even directly related to athletic performance, such as the presence or absence of a Y chromosome. I would also add, and this is important, more isn't the final word on it. One thing lacking this paper is the perspective of trans individuals themselves. Is it too much to ask that the question should be resolved by scientifically informed trans folk? who have actual experience with this condition, rather than old, culturally hidebound old men like Keith Moore, as enlightened as he might be, or me. Okay, let's think about that, and I'll let you go there. Thanks. Oh no, i become one of those people with a Patreon account and also no idea how to properly format the scrolling credits. Bear with me.